find a piece of the kiln prop that doesn't feel too wet. Yeah, I just want to level that there. What you're watching here is the packing of the kiln. And it is quite a delicate process. These pots are all absolutely raw, so they're quite fragile. So often it's a case of trying to delicately place things and support them with one another. Um, hence the need for the leveling of the kiln floor. A beaker? Yeah, one of the one of the, one of the narrowest of the beakers would be good. Yeah, that'll do. Pretty narrow. I think that'll do it. But I'm also trying to make sure that the pack is dense enough because um, it's the pots themselves that will provide the thermal mass, the heat sink that will hold the heat in the kiln. You may have noticed that as I was putting the pots into the kiln, the uh, large uh, Vulcan head pots, three of them went down the center of the kiln. They're there obviously to fire, but they also provide a strong structural core onto which the capping can be placed. And I suspect that Roman potters probably would have done the same. Although, provided you've placed your pots reasonably well stacked inside the kiln, there shouldn't really be too much problem supporting the roof on them. But it is a fair bit of weight. And as you'll see in a wee while, when we start to cap that over with clay, it puts on even more weight. As you'll see, we light the fire right outside the firebox. Now, the, what I refer to as the firebox, archaeologists often refer to as the flu. This is the only time during the firing when that actually acts as a flu. Because a flu, its sole job is to carry hot gases from one place to another. For most of the firing, the fire will be inside that firebox. At the beginning, we're looking for a very, very slow increase in temperature. You'll notice we're using very thin split timber. Almost certainly, the Romans wouldn't have. They probably would have used coppice timber. Unlike a sort of domestic fire where you want big logs that will carry on simmering away for a long period of time, in a pottery kiln, what you want is a very fast burn. Along the A66 near Scotch Corner, uh, excavations there found a kiln which still had the remains of bundled heather in the firebox, would be a great fuel. But right through until the sort of 19th century, potters used bundled brashwood, but also bundled or faggoted uh, gorse. And gorse is very high in oil content, so in actual fact would provide a really fast burn particularly in the later stages of the fire. And so, it, you know, when you're up at the top end and you want a really intense heat, that would be an ideal fuel. This material we're mixing here is uh, very akin to the sorts of material you find around this type of kiln on excavated sites. I saw it at East Teslington, I saw it again uh, at the kilns down near Newark. A sort of combination of clay, burned material reddened by the fire uh, bits of charcoal all sorts of detritus and fragments of pottery that you find uh, around a kiln site at what just over 200 degrees 212 degrees on thermocouple number one but we've reached a stage now where it's starting to get to a stage where i can't get my hand too close to that without boiling it so that that's that's about the sort of temperature less comfortable temperature level we're at at the moment just looking at those ways that the romans could have measured temperature in the early stages of the fire when it's still absolutely black inside so at this stage you've just stoked yeah uh, yeah yeah just stoked so the temperature now is about there <laughs> which is all a roman potter would have known that the temperature was about there <laughs> And of course, the use of timber in a kiln like this, the amount of timber we're using, does have implications for what else would have been going around on around a Roman pottery site. We're starting to stoke quite a lot now, so you can see that fire's really built up, and therefore the fuel consumption does go up. Now, you're going to see at the end of this firing that the fuel consumption was not large for a single firing. 
But if you consider areas perhaps in the Nien Valley where a lot of potters are working in the same area, um, fuel consumption could be quite significant. Now I talked earlier about the fact that in the early stages of the fire you have to judge the temperature simply by placing your hand over the exit flue and feeling the temperature of the gases that are coming out. But once you're over about 500 and heading up, you start to see the glow down at the bottom of the kiln. We're now at about 650 and that glow is starting to be quite significant down there. Uh, we'll see it move up through the kiln as time goes on. 770-ish. 769 um, here, 770 here. Uh, the coolest one is the probe over there, 729. It's about 3.30 in the afternoon now and the glow inside the kiln is starting to increase and move right up through the body of the pottery and you can see there the pots at the top are dully glowing, the pots down at the bottom well and truly. Raking out the dead ashes here just to uh, make some space to get the air in. One of the major mistakes in kiln fire is often to overstoke, but this is fine, this is good, but it, at this stage you need to get the dead stuff out from underneath, so that's what we're doing. You can see here that the pots are starting to even up in colour. The ones at the top are glowing brighter now. There's still a big differential, but it is starting to even up. And that's what we're trying to do now. At this point of stage in the firing, you try to close down the exit flue a little bit, keep the fire burning nice and brightly, and get that evenness to the temperature. You'll see that Sarah's got a baffle in front of her where she's stoking now. This uh, There's a tile standing there. Um, she's using that to protect her when she rakes out there we are again looking down into the kiln nice and bright nice and glow that's one of the head pots you can see there one of the ones supporting the capping of the kiln and looking further down into the kiln you can see this sort of bright orange lower down there we go, there's Sarah raking using her protection baffle. And the reason for that is that the radiated heat coming back from the firebox is really intense. Um, there are tiles from Pentascufia in Greece from 500 BC, which show potters doing exactly this, raking out from the fire. Uh, but they're standing right in front of the fire and they're naked. Now, I think that's because they're showing themselves in front of their gods and therefore they're showing themselves as they were when they came into the world. But there is absolutely no way they were doing that. If they did, they would be completely fried. They would be blistered. They would be burned. That's good. That's a really good burn, that is. Look at that. <laughs> Not John's head, though. <laughs> oh, hello. <laughs> This inbrex has uh, split completely end to end. I didn't hear that. I thought I would hear that crack. No, I don't think it's been just working its way along bit by bit. What Sarah's starting to do here is to pack the fuel into the back of the firebox, push it forwards towards the combustion chamber to give us plenty of space to get fuel into the firebox um, so as we can create the reducing atmosphere in the sealed kiln to give us the coloration we want. Okay. Be careful, yeah. Give me a shout when you're ready and I'll shove. Right, okay. So, Pete, I'm just going to go here. Oh, excellent. You're getting the flames anyway, but you're going to have without me doing it. That's good. I'm just keeping it right in the stable. Yeah, that's fine, that's good. No, that's fine, I'm going to uh, move these in a bit. Yeah, 
Trial. Push it with a trial. I think they want to stabilize one. You want another one? Yeah, I'll use this here. Okay. Okay. Open. Now dry it out sufficiently. <laughs> Heads down, everyone. <laughs> right. Okay. So that's going in there. Right. Just Stop playing. Be, yeah, yeah. If you're. Okay, so it's the following day, August 16th, 2020, and we're starting to open the kiln. Um, it's still pretty warm inside there, um, but first thing I'm doing here is taking away the clamming from around the firebox closure. You'll remember, we stuffed that firebox absolutely full of wood last night, so... What I'm hoping to find when I open it is charcoal. But what I actually find is an empty firebox. Now, that's sort of bad news from my point of view because I was hoping for blackwares. I suspect there's several reasons for this. I think that we maybe didn't rake out sufficiently before we packed the wood in. Um, we didn't put wood in that was quite wet enough. Uh, that would have probably helped. And maybe we didn't quite get the seal good enough. Um, none of that's Sarah's fault. That's the boss. The boss who should have been uh, saying, no, let's get something more solid in there. But what it meant was that I wasn't anticipating the contents of the perkiln being particularly black. You have to remake this top every time. So it's, it's what you call a top loader kiln. So we'll be stopping there. That's that's the structure of the kiln that stays, and this top piece comes off every time. And one of the things you find when you excavate kiln sites is lots of burned material. <laughs> so this is this is basically what the capping looks like. It, it, it's got it, lots of random clay, but quite thick. So it does give you it does give you a very good insulation layer. How are you doing? I'm good. Yeah, you're terrified here. Yeah, you're fine. That would be a horrible thinking sound. Uh, fine. Be my fault. Uh, 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 you got that one? Good. Excellent. We've got a nice grey ware though. That's, that's, that's a really nice grey colour we're getting out of there. Yeah, there's the end. And yet again, this kiln has done its stuff. We've got an entire firing without a single loss. Not one pot has actually broken within that firing. And out of 88 pots, that really is quite impressive. I do believe partly it's down to the fact that the clay bar floor acts as a heat sink and cuts down the thermal shock to the actual wear in the chamber. The only pot that had any damage to it whatsoever was this one, which was at the very bottom of that centre stack supporting the roof of the kiln, and on closer inspection had these pressure cracks. And that's all they are. They are pressure cracks from the stress of holding up the entire roof of the kiln. And that brings us to what remains on the site after we've finished, because these are things that have implications for what you might find in the excavation of a site like this. Um, the detritus from the kiln roof is here being broken up by John, enthusiastically getting stuck in as usual. I could sit and watch. <laughs> no, no, we're happy, John. We're very happy. <laughs> But there's, you know, there's the wood stacks that are now being repiled to dry more wood. This is the what the interior of the kiln looks like. The, those cracks that were spoken about during the firing. This is what you see on the surface. And of course, this is the sort of thing that needs repairing. And this material from the roof of the kiln and the broken sherds that are left over and the ash piles that uh, are from the firebox, all of these will stay till the next fire and, and be used again. Oh, you would, yeah. Oh,
That's a good, that's a really good burn, that is. Look at that.